The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello, this is hello, this is Patty Hunter, Patty's Page. Welcome to my show. I have a special guest today, and right now I'm going to introduce you to my co-host, John Dickmeyer. Hello, John. Hello, Patty. How are you? I'm fine. And would you like to introduce our uh, our wonderful guest here? No, but that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> this is Joseph Townsend. He's going to be. He's, he's a candidate for city uh, council at large. So, uh, wow, that's a big num name, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, where were you born and raised? I was born in Fort Wayne, and I grew up in Fort Wayne my entire childhood. And I've moved away from Fort Wayne as an adult, but I was born and raised in Fort Wayne my entire life, uh, childhood life, so. Where do you live now? I live in Fort Wayne as well, the Boy area near oh, Lutheran boy. Hospital area. So. Ah. so where did you go to school? Um, so that is a loaded question because oh. I, went, I went to Ivy Tech and got my associate's degree in paralegal. Um, from there I went to IPFW and got my business management degree. And then I also have a degree from Liberty University in education. So, Paralegal? You can do your own... Uh Write-ups, applications. Um, so at the time, I was wanting to, uh, I was wanting to go to law school, but um, things have things changed, and uh, I decided that I didn't, that was wasn't the avenue I wanted to go. So, who influenced you the most while growing up? So <clears throat> definitely my pastor um, growing up, which was Rick Hawks at the chapel. Um, I always liked. He always did a question and answer. Uh, series at the end of every service and he would touch on issues that were important and relevant like pro-life issues and pro -life, marriage issues and everything like that and then also one of the things my mom <clears throat> when I was growing up she, she always put me to bed and um, had WBCL listening in the background so I'd always listen to um, grew up listening to James Dobson and focus on the family on the radio and things like that so and he always touched on political issues even on his radio show so that was always a big impact to me so Hmm. So, what interested you in running for this particular office? So, I never thought I would actually run for political office. I always um, grew up working for other people on other people's campaigns. But the one thing that interested me was when I moved back to Fort Wayne, um, I noticed that a lot of things, with a 7 to 2 majority on city council being Republican, a lot of times they were not running, they were not voting their conservative values. So to me, it was important to be represented from a conservative standpoint. So that's what got me interested in actually running myself because it, I viewed it as other people not doing the job correctly. So, what kind of conservative do you mean? Um, so being uh, socially conservative as well as fiscally conservative. Um, it's, you, you'll get some candidates that will be fiscally conservative, but then they'll mention that social issues don't matter at a local level, which I completely disagree with. Or you'll get some candidates that might be socially conservative. They'll show up to Right to Life events and things like that. So they are socially conservative, but then they vote for tax increases and things like that. So I believe you need a social and a fiscal conservative both. So, Where do you work now? Um, so I come from a hotel and a retail management background, um, but right now I'm a manager at a uh, sales manager at the Renna Center in New Haven. So, um, but most of my experience has been in retail as well as hotel management. So, mm -hmm. so you, how long have you been working then? Um, so I've been at my current position um, for about a year now, mm. um, and then. Also, in terms of political experience, I've worked other people's campaigns, as I said. So I worked on, I was a campaign manager for Ivan Hood when he ran for city council at large. 
And then um, I was I moved to Utah and I was the field director for Mia Love when she mm. ran for Congress. Oh, yeah. She was the first um, woman, uh, woman Republican African American to be elected to Congress. So, and then um, I volunteered on many campaigns, including the last election. I volunteered with Jim Banks for Congress. So, Jim Banks, he's a good chap. He is. Yep. Yes. I was glad to see him uh, not only win but win dominantly in that race. So. If elected, what role will you be filling? Um, so I will be filling, I'm running for city council at large. So John Crawford is running for mayor, so his posi position on city council is available. So I will um, be filling his position. So it is a pick three race with five candidates on the ballot. So while some people say there's one seat available because w somebody that's an incumbent is running for mayor, I see it as there being three positions available, and the incumbents are not um, are not guaranteed to make it to be reelected either. So I I see there as pick three race because there's three positions available. So with five candidates running, so what are some of the issues that you're working on then? So <clears throat> one of the biggest things is I'm unhappy with the two tax increases and the water rate increase that City Council has passed in the last four years. Um, the income tax increase being one of them is affecting senior citizens as a whole, mm. as well as the, weight, uh, the water rate increase. I've heard a lot of senior citizens that they live budget to budget, um, paycheck to paycheck on Social Security, right. and they saw a huge water rate increase. So seeing that water rate increase has definitely affected them um, in a lot of ways. So I think that we need to spend money wisely so that we don't have to rely on tax increases. Um, both Republican candidates for mayor have been talking about zero balance budgeting, and I think that city council should demand it. Um, you know, to say that you're for zero balance budgeting, but then pass the budget is is going against what you say that you stand for. So, if you support zero balance budgeting, then you, you should have demanded it on city council. So, yeah, that would have required a veto, or. or Six to three, six, a six person vote, yeah. That's right. So um, you have to have a mayor that would be willing to do that, or you have to have the candidates <clears throat> elected for city council that won't allow um, huge increases in budget. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, the city council, the mayor proposes the budget to city council, and then city council can line, line item vote to get rid of anything in the budget that they disagree with, and that takes a six-person, um, or that takes a five-person five majority vote. And so, as I said, there's seven Republicans on city council, and it seems like Tom Henry gets his budget and gets what he demands 95% of the time. So. What, just electing Republicans is not working, so we mm. need to have conservatives on there. So, let's switch over. Uh, lately, there's been a lot of uh, hostility in schools, high schools. Now, how can we protect our children from others who bring in guns? Do you know? So, I would say that one thing that I am passionate about is that. Gun-free zones, um, in my opinion, are, actu are actually what create the crime to begin with, is that if you have a gun-free zone, then that's where the people the, that have the guns are going to go. So I would say that a good person with a, the only thing that's going to stop you against a, a bad person with a gun is to have a good person with a gun. So, so what about the teachers? So I would say that if you train the teacher, the biggest part is the training. So I wouldn't want just any teacher to have a gun. Um, but if you properly train the teacher, and if they're certified in gun safety, then I would, I would support a teacher be, you know, being able to have a gun. And at the Indiana Legislator, what they proposed is to have two teachers in every school um, that are trained, and you would not know which of the, which two teachers have the gun. So that's the biggest aspect: is the mystery aspect of it will prevent people um, will prevent the bad people with a gun from going into the schools. So they won't know who to target. They'll exactly. Be oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So so I mean, if if you just say that any teacher can have a gun, <laughs> I would not. Um, you know. That would be the ideal, but the, the real ideal is to make sure that they're trained in gun safety as well so that the teachers or the, the students are protected as well. Because there's been reports from other states of people um, 
they, they allow any teacher to have a gun, and then the teacher will uh, have the gun go off in the classroom or something because they're not, they weren't taught the safety aspect of the gun as well. So, um, so yeah, while I'm a proud member of the NRA and everything like that, I do think that you need to have, um, sit the, uh, have a safety aspect of it and teach your kids the safety and then if you're going to allow guns in schools the teachers need to follow the safety aspect. And they of it. have to make sure that the kids cannot get to these guns. Exactly, yeah. So um, so, so just safety like just first. like in your house um, <clears throat> I would definitely recommend locking up your guns if you have young kids um, but in the, at night you know you would want to have access to it as well you know like maybe under your bed or somewhere that the kids not going to know but yeah so just being able to it being in a position where you have easy access to it but the kid doesn't have easy access to it well, as well, that's so. right because kids are very curious let's look at another side of this issue which is uh, violence on the streets uh, oh. murder murder rate on the streets um, what are your views to curbing that? So a biggest uh, aspect of that is, to me, is the, the term deterrence. So you want to make it so that people do not want to commit the crime. Um, right now, there are only four detectives um, to solve homicides and to solve murder and robbery. So there's four detectives to solve all of those issues right now. Here in Fort Wayne? In Fort, Fort Wayne, yeah. So, so there was six um, mm -hmm. as of December, and then mm -hmm. two retired, so now there's only four. So You need more. You, you need more. So part of the budget calls for more, but yet our budget is not going into fully staffing the police department. So I think the first aspect of it is that you need to fully staff the police department, and part of that would be to have the correct number of detectives. Um, so I would like to double the number of detectives we have to solve the crimes because if the, solves are, the crimes are being solved, then that will um, deter people from wanting to commit other crimes. So Your Neighborhood watch, we should have more of that? Then. Um, yeah, so I believe in community policing um, as well. I think that's a big aspect not of vigilantes, it. But <laughs> not vigilantes, but not vigilantes. Yeah, yeah, just, well, like, as an example, if you know that your neighbor, if, um, as an example, if you know that your neighbor is a, a drug house, then you should, you know, report that, um, and, um, But you don't approach them. Yeah, you don't approach them, but you, you, through the police, you would call the police and let them know, um, because I run into a lot of situations where somebody will say, well, my neighbor's a drug house, and they know it, that causes the crimes, that causes the gangs to go into the neighborhood. Because um, a lot of these murders are, you know, the gangs going after the people with the drugs and everything like that. So drugs does have an aspect of with the crime as well. But it's, uh, it's a matter of approaching it through the police and proper um, protection of the person that reports the crime. We need a better witness protection program. Um, for the people that commit the crimes because they're, they're, they're fearing for their lives as well that the gangs are going to go after them. So, so um, how can we stop uh, the mounting crime? There's a lot of shooting out there, like we said before, and uh, certain areas of Fort Wayne is more vulnerable to that. Yeah, so <clears throat> we're definitely... Um, taking the budget and we're redirecting it the wrong way. So like as an example, um, a lot of, with the riverfront development, they've spent you know millions of dollars on the riverfront development and in the last six months there's been four killings on the oh. riverfront development. Oh. So, so while they're spending the money to clean up the rivers, they're not focused on the public safety aspect of things. So public safety should be first and foremost, and then you look at redevelopment. So if you're redeveloping and don't even focus on the public safety aspect of it, that's when you're going to start seeing killings even in areas that are nicer areas. So, And um, speaking about riverfront, it river, what's it called? Riverfront development. Riverfront development. Well, the people who are there that had to be escorted off the homeless. What happens to them? How so, can we help them? So, I mean, I think a big aspect of that is to make sure that our homeless shelters are adequately funded from the city um, to make sure that the rescue mission has the proper um, tools and that they have the resources from a city aspect of it to make sure that we don't have any homeless people in Fort Wayne. Um, now, the one aspect of it that you're going to get is the people with mental health issues that while we have 
a house for them that they want to be homeless. So um, that's why I think curbing it through having um, nonprofits that deal with the mental health aspect of it is good as well. Mm -hmm. um, like you have the Shepherd's House, um, you have Park Center, you have Bowen, you have uh, areas that can help them with the mental health aspect of it. So some of them are just families who just are out of luck, who uh, lose their jobs because someone became very ill and they lose a, their home and everything like that. It, it's nice to see if we can be able to bring in people to build houses for the homeless or find houses that could be given to the homeless and help them get jobs. Yeah, so I definitely agree with that. Um, and I think one of the things is if you go to, especially in the southeast part of Fort Wayne, you'll see a lot of boarded up houses um, that the city own that we could invest a minimal amount of money into um, to have um, to be able to put homeless into them. So um, if and plus that helps the home value in those areas as well. If you go into an area where half of the street has boarded up homes, that doesn't help the home values no. of the people in that area. No. So, um, so being able to curb that through um, not having abandoned houses in Fort yeah. Wayne and taking minimal amount of taxpayer dollars into that, um, which is to me, when I say that, I, I wanna reiterate that I think that we should um, take from areas that we might not necessarily need to put the money, like downtown redevelopment. I don't think we need to just spend $67 million on downtown redevelopment. We can take some of that $67 million that we already committed to downtown redevelopment and instead focus on the homeless and other nonprofit organizations. Because so. they're part of our community. They're part exactly. of our family mm -hmm. here in Fort Wayne and mm -hmm. Allen County. So we should take care of them as well. They should help, we should be able to help them be able to stand on their feet again. That's what, that's what mm -hmm. I'm strong about. Me as well, yeah. Let's look at uh, another issue. And another issue is redevelopment. Um, what is your position on the city spending money to encourage private redevelopment? Mm. So I'm very big on the aspect that um, that private businesses do a much better job than government. Mm. So I think that instead of using public dollars um, for private enterprise, that we need to have a mayor that, um, as Tim Smith says in his campaign, that we need to have a mayor that f flies on a jet and goes into to, and talks to the businesses and tells them about Fort Wayne and what we have available so that they'll want to come to Fort Wayne versus us offering them all these tax abatements that come to Fort Wayne. So I believe that you can have the, the development through the business wanting to come to Fort Wayne rather than you having to bribing them to come to Fort Wayne. True. Speaking about uh, development, uh, I understand that St. Joseph Hospital, what's happening with that? Um, so St. Joe Hospital is now going to do a remodel. Um, so IU Health has decided to come to Fort Wayne and they're going to have a, a hospital facility downtown. So then Lutheran looked at that and saw that they wanted to be competitive. Um, so competition drives better results for everybody, I believe. And through that, then um, uh, St. Joe has decided to do a remodel as well, so. And um, I understand some of our elementary schools, are they being shut down? Um, so uh, it, whatever school so Fort Wayne Community Schools is doing a bad job of budgeting overall I mean if you look at Fort Wayne Community Schools there are students that have to walk to school because of the busing um, situation in Fort in Fort Wayne Community Schools so um, I believe Fort Wayne Community Schools is very top heavy and Wendy Robinson as a whole is she makes over $200,000 a year, which is, I think is ridiculous for a school superintendent. So I think that Fort Wayne Community School is very top heavy. And so that's resulted in some bad budgeting decisions at Fort Wayne Community Schools. So. Yes. So uh, if you look, I want to get back to redevelopment because on a number of these projects, and I look at the Electric Works Project, and I look at um, a number of downtown buildings, uh, Ash Center, uh, and, and even uh, 
oh, such things as uh, Parkview Field, where the city actually has put in loan guarantees mm -hmm. and spent city money. Yeah. What is your approach to that? So in terms of, um, in, with Electric Works, they took legacy fund money, which is using our, um, our current infrastructure, like our lights and our city utilities, and they gambled that for Electric Works. So I would definitely not support any, um, any redevelopment that used uh, legacy fund money. So I was very active in the Paula Hughes campaign when she ran for mayor back in 2011, and her platform was to take the legacy fund money at the time and invest it and then use just the interest alone to fix the water piping and to use it for infrastructure. Mm. So if we would have done that, then we wouldn't have seen the water rate increase that we're seeing because the water rate increase is the pay for the piping. So they took the money that um, to pay for, the, they had to raise the water rate increase to pay for piping, when if we would have stopped spending the legacy fund money, they could have used that money to pay for the piping. So, um, Well, wow, catch question, 22 here. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> It's getting colder outside. Uh, the buses. How would you increase more buses in this town? Because it's every oh, what every hour on the hour, and if you stand outside in the winter cold, I mean you need bus shelters and all that sort because you can get real cold out there, especially the elderly mm -hmm. and the little ones. So the biggest aspect of that is to have a working relationship with the. Uh, congressman, as an example, to get um, to get grants because the City Link relies uh, majority of federal dollars um, to pour into it and state money pour into it. So, um, so the majority of what City Link relies on is federal grant money as well as um, state money. So, the taxpayers of Fort Wayne do not pay very much money into for the City Link uh, bus system. So, we need to have a better relationship with the federal government and state level to get more grant money, um, which d then doesn't interfere with our tax base. Um, it's, you know, the state level and the federal government. So you get the grant money from the state and... And the federal. And the federal. Mm -hmm. hmm. How about tobacco prices? Do they need to go up or are they going up? Um, so there's, um, so there's actually a proposal right now to increase, uh, well, cause they, they raised the gas, ta when they raised the gas tax, before that, they raised the tax on cigarettes, um, and there was actually an interesting uh, topic on this: is that when they did raise the the tax on cigarettes, it actually mm -hmm. didn't curve the amount of young people that were smoking. So especially that vapor thing. The vapor, yeah. Uh, that's not good. That's not, it's <laughs> yeah. got to. It's got. What do you got? Um, um, well. It, well, it has, th there's been reports of people that when they're smoking it, it gets into the, into, there were some kids that were doing it, and then one, the one just recently died from the oh. vapor, so, because the liquid that was in it got into his nice. mouth and in his lungs, oh, yeah. no. Not only that, but you have problems with the chargers that go with, yeah, with, explode. with these, and there are people that have been seriously injured. Yeah, uh, but now you have more and more uh, desire throughout the country to legalize marijuana. Oh my, that's a touchy one. I, I'm I'm sorry to do that yeah. to you, but uh, what is your position on on marijuana? So I do not support legalizing marijuana. However, I do support, um, my belief is that, especially for first-time offenders of, that are arrested for using marijuana, if they're a first-time offender, I believe that they should be in a rehabilitation facility rather than in jail. So, yeah. um, so that's a big aspect. I've talked to many of the rehab houses, um, and some, an interesting statistic is that it costs $100 a day to have somebody in jail. Mm. It costs $20 a day to have them in a rehab home. That's a lot. So we save difference. $80 a day yeah. from them being in a rehab home, and then their probability of them being rehabilitated is a lot greater. So 
generally speaking, it's about 80%, 80 to 90% of them, the chance of them being rehabilitated in a rehab home and in jail, a lot of times it, it causes them to be even harder criminals. So, um, so I, I would yeah. say I do not support legalizing marijuana, but I do support, in a sense, decriminalizing it, especially for first time offenders. So. I, let's go to this final question for today. Uh, you're pro-life. Correct. So, let's chat about its evil, especially about abortion. What, if elected, how can you help to continue to ban all the uh, opening abortion mills and people who are trying to push it on us again, like they did before? Mm. So that, that's an interesting question because there are some people that running that say, well, at a city level, you can't do anything about abortion. Well, in South Bend, they actually use regulations to stop Planned Parenthood from coming into South Bend. So I believe that you can use existing law and regulations to prevent, um, to prevent abortion. Another example is that a while back we said that if you are a doctor that performs abortions, you have to also be licensed at a hospital. Hmm. So that actually stops um, abortions in Allen County because Lutheran Hospital, which is Lutheran related, um, they said that, that they would not have their doctors perform abortions. So Lutheran pr stopped abortions from being able to happen in Fort Wayne because then no doctors could be, um, could be licensed at Lutheran Hospital and then perform abortions outside of abortion. So, Thank God for that. So what you're talking about, uh, a, a major way of keeping out um, organizations like Planned Parenthood would be through zoning. Is that what you're proposing? Um, zoning is one aspect of it, but an, another aspect of it, as I said, is just to use regulations, um, use the current laws to prevent them from being able to come here. So, I mean, I know Allen County Right to Life is big on that. Um, you know, obviously we would love a Supreme Court decision that says abortion is illegal, but every time that we've tried that up to this point, it has not worked. So mm. you have to use what is in, within your power and what is, that you have within your tools to use. And using the uh, regulations has worked. So, I mean, Kathy Humbarger has been very good on using regulations to, to stop some of these things. So. And more young people begin to realize that abortion is not right. It's not right. So we're at the end of our show. What would you like to share with my audience about you running for city council at large? What do you want to give? To what are you going to expect from it? Or <clears throat> so um, I've de I've already taken a pledge where I want to. Uh, I'm only going to serve two terms. So I believe that career politicians and people that are in there a long time are a big um, are a big issue with it. So I would definitely say that I'm only going to do two terms, and that I can accomplish what I want to accomplish within that two terms, and then move on to something else. Um, I'm happy in my current career as well, so you can do both. Um, that's a nice thing about city council. Um, but yeah, I mean, I believe that we need a fiscal conservative as well as a social conservative that's not afraid to stand up for their convictions, so. Thank you, thank you. So this is getting towards the end, like I said. Oh, the end, I don't like that. Well, we'll see you again. Well, listen, thank you so thank much you. for coming on to my show. Thank you. Joseph Townsend, and thank you, my co-host, John Dick Meyer. Thank you, Patty. Okay, you're welcome. Oh, oh that was well, rough. It's wonderful, isn't it? But, oh, uh, anyways, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. And thank you, Joseph, or Joe, I'll call you Joe. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate the invite. Joe. Okay, thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. God bless, and hope to hear from you. Bye-bye.